It is, of course, time for the press preview. A first look at the front pages as they arrive. Uh, over the remainder of the hour, we'll be taking a look at what's making the headlines with the director of the British Foreign Policy Group, Sophia Gaston, and the communications advisor and former aide to Boris Johnson, Gito Hari. To them in just a moment, but let's take you through uh, the front pages that we have, starting with the Metro. And according to that paper, a third of UK adults have now had both doses of a COVID vaccine. The Telegraph warning, though, that 300,000 people have missed urgent checks for cancer, which could spark another crisis in the NHS as the pandemic winds down. The dentist will see you in three years, the Daily Mail leading with NHS waiting times. The Financial Times reports on the Belarusian government forcing a Ryanair flight to divert and land in Minsk, also that it could arrest a prominent opposition activist. Staggering statistic, this at just 1.6% of rape cases leads to charges being brought. That's the lead story for The Guardian. And as previously mentioned, we're joined tonight uh, by Sophia Gaston and Gito Hari. Uh, lovely to see the both of you. Um, and this, this story, uh, Sophia, that we're going to start with this evening on the front of the FT, and I imagine it will be creeping up in, uh, in lots of the other papers as well. Uh, Belarus forcing a flight to land in Minsk by scrambling a MiG-29. I mean, you could make this stuff up. It's absolutely bonkers. I mean, this is a flight that was an EU flight, so going from Athens um, in Greece uh, to Lithuania, so two EU capitals, um, and this is an EU-owned company, Ryanair, and this was just an ordinary passenger flight. These these were people, you know, going home to see family or, or going for a weekend holiday. Um, but on this flight, you had a an opposition activist to the really brutal Belarus regime. And what happened is, as soon as the flight gets over Belarus airspace, um, there's essentially a foiled uh, bomb threat. Um, and essentially, they force the pilots to land, make an emergency landing escorted by a, a Belarusian plane. Um, and essentially, they uh, stop on the tarmac and arrest this activist. And uh, it's just caused uh, extraordinary drama in the EU, as you can imagine. And I mean, it's, it's just a really um, shocking scene. And I think everybody's aware that this activist who's been pulled off the plane uh, is, is facing pretty serious consequences. Uh, he's being arrested. He could face the death penalty. It's just another example of this regime really cracking down. But it's a really tough test for the EU because this is so brazen. It involves civilians, you know, real, real, just ordinary people whose lives are at risk. Um, and I think it's going to be a test for the EU to come together. Can they be a credible foreign policy actor? Can they get all their voices, all their institutions in lockstep with a clear message here? Um, so I think the next 24 hours are critical for that. Um, but the world is watching on. Yeah, I mean, Gito, uh, uh, as Sophia is alluding to, you know, pan-European condemnation of it. We wait to see what that what that turns into. But of course, when I spoke with them, the, the chairman of the Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Tom Tugan, had a little bit earlier on. He made the point: Look, Lukashenko has not acted without, you know, some some, some fairly significant approval uh, from Moscow. We do know that Vladimir Putin will have had at least had her eyes on this operation. Yeah, it's extremely sobering and a sign of just how dangerous our world is and how the rule of law is not something you can take for granted, even in somewhere like this, that is essentially, you know, on, on, the, on the fringes of where we are. In fact, you know, as Sophia was saying, it sort of involves EU citizens flying from one EU city to another. So what started off like the sort of plot of the long-awaited Bond movie that some of us are still desperate to see and wondering when it's going to come out, turns into something extremely serious that makes us all worry just when you thought that the only issue with flying was was COVID and, you know, green and amber zones and all that. You've got this and the possibility of being downed and escorted by a military plane uh, because somebody on your plane is undesirable as far as one of the most undesirable regimes in the world is concerned. Serious implications, according to the, the Foreign Secretary. We will see what those, those will turn out to be. Um, but, Sophia, let's, I just want to give our viewers two, two papers, in fact, because they are related stories. The front of the Metro, uh, their story there, uh, celebrating the success of the vaccination rollout. You know, one in three have now had both their jags, which is incredible. But then, of course, you turn to the Daily Telegraph and yeah, Dominic Cummings uh, pops up once again, talking about, you know, the government's strategy at the time. But let's start with the, with the vaccination 
vaccine rollout. This is an achievement. It is something to be welcomed. And it is the way that we are going to get normality or some form of it at some point in the future. The vaccine remains the good news story. And I think, you know, what the UK government really hopes is the happy ending or, or at least a sort of happy interlude in, after a pretty difficult 2020. Um, the news is that now a third of UK adults have been double jabbed. So uh, on their way to being fully protected, which is just an extraordinary logistical feat. Um, and I think we should all be really proud of our institutions for, for delivering that. Um, and also for the British people, I think it shows real really strong foundations of community and social trust that everyone said, yes, you know, we've we've had a, a pretty difficult five years. Everyone's been at each other's throats, but we've come together. And I think I think Britain's feeling a bit more united as a nation now, and this vaccination program has been really integral to that. Um, but I do think, you know, we have to um, obviously still be a bit careful that we've had this Indian variant um, on our shores, and uh, it's had everyone rather nervous the last few weeks. So I think it has been a race against time with the vaccination program. We've got to get everyone jabbed as quickly as possible. The latest data that uh, has come out over the weekend shows that the vaccines are effective. So it's just really important that we get um, as many jabs and as many arms as possible. But um, I think, you know, we've been so trained to see these cases going up and just have that real sense of fear and foreboding um, because of what happened last year. And we kept thinking, oh gosh, other, another lockdown on the horizon. The vaccine is a game changer. And I think it's just going to take us a little while to get our heads around that. It certainly is. And Begito, take us to the Telegraph, though, and Dominic Cummings. And perhaps you might be able to explain to me exactly what on earth he is trying to achieve. I mean, he, he talks about, you know, herd immunity being at the heart of the government's strategy. Priti Patel was the latest in a long line of cabinet ministers to deny that's the case. I mean, I, I know it's late on a Sunday and I am a bit daft, but I remember Patrick Vallance standing at the, le at the lectern in Downing Street directly referencing herd immunity as part of this government strategy. What, what's Cummings up to? Yeah, and I, I've i spoken to people, you know, over the last uh, few weeks uh, about Dominic Cummings and what he's up to, and uh, one or two have said to me that he was the one, and you can imagine this from the kind of guy he was, he is, uh, that, that is captivated by the idea of herd immunity. It's eccentric, it's wild, it's sort of counterintuitive, it sort of involves doing something hugely controversial, and he had to be weaned off this idea is what a couple of people have told me, but he's doing the opposite, of course. Just when the vaccine uh, programme really is going gangbusters, and I've been doing a little bit of volunteering as a vaccinator myself, pleased to say oh, well I stabbed well about 75 people in the arm the other day. Um, just when the last battle wins the war, he's trying to drag it back to the grim start and throw mud and try and bring down, you know, a prime minister that he was once supposedly loyal to, but he's now clearly bent on trying to sort of destroy him completely. Um, Sophia, though, the, the, the front of the Daily Mail, I understand that some people, particularly in, in, in Whitehall, want to have this public inquiry. Not now, just at some point in the future. But, you know, St Augustine, to look forward, you must first look back. And we have some real problems in the health service at the moment. As the Daily Mail makes it clear, some patients are being forced to wait as much as three years for an appointment. Yes, well, it's sort of, it's almost like there's just been this enormous storm and uh, what will be coming on the other side is just sort of those sort of strange, eerie days after you've had a big storm and sort of there's <laughs> branches everywhere and everything's a bit displaced and then it all comes into into a sort of clarity from, from the clear skies. And I think that's essentially what we're going to be entering. I mean, it's there's going to be a lot of detritus around that, a lot of things, a lot of problems that were emerging during the pandemic that we just couldn't see when we were in the storm. And all of that's going to come into view now. And obviously, our health system is going to be one, you know, really front and centre of that, because, of course, everything was done to create as much space and capacity in the NHS as possible to deal with this really deadly and frightening pandemic. Um, but of course, there are many other ways in which people are suffering or, or, or um, you know, new uh, different things emerging that ne will need to be looked at and treated. And I think a lot of that has been sort of swept under the carpet. People haven't had their minds on those other types of health. It's really difficult to get appointments. So a lot of people are just put off. And what we know is that 
when you put barriers um, to accessing the health system like that, there's a whole swathes of people who just sort of fall through the cracks. And that's really what they're warning here. You've got a lot of really senior people in, in the medical profession essentially coming out and saying there's this silent, invisible crisis that's been happening. Um, and if we're not careful, um, things like dentistry, cancer diagnoses, these are sorts of things that we could just be missing. Um, and of course, we know there could be some pretty significant consequences for that down the track. So we need to get ourselves back on the road we were at before. Um, but that's going to require everybody sort of getting over this mental hurdle of accessing the health service. You know, I think I think there needs to be a message coming out now saying, look, we're through the worst of it. We're open for business. Please come back and and start seeing your GP and start, uh, you know, looking over and making sure that you're checking for those signs, because I think people just haven't had the capacity to do that. Mm. Um, but we just have to sort of make the case now that we're in, moving into a new era and those things are really important. Yeah, see, see your GP, Sophia, if, if you're lucky enough to be able to get an appointment. Um, guys, we have to pause there and, uh, and take a quick break. But after afterwards, a, a story that's very close to my heart. In Vino Veritas, we'll tell you why Australian winemakers are hoping for a post-Brexit trade deal. Uh, they're off for a drink. We'll see you after this. I think one of the things that we've all realised dur during this pandemic is how important our well-being and our, our mental health is. Now, of course, it's important to separate mental illness from well-being and health. Um, but I think all of us have wanted to um, take control, I think, and do a bit more to look after ourselves, ultimately. And, you know, whether that's getting outside more often, uh, catching some natural light, exercising, uh, communicating with those that, that we hold dear, um, making sure we're managing our stress effectively, we're sleeping well, all these things play a part into how we feel. And so, you know, that's why I wrote the book Live Well Every Day. I wanted to kind of bring the science out there, my personal experience and my professional experience and put that together into, I guess, key chapters that people hopefully can can use to improve their own health and ultimately feel feel better from it. I think it's it's been different for everyone. You know, everyone is, is different. Everyone's an individual. And I think the pandemic in whatever way has put pressure on everyone, whether you're on the front line working in, uh, in AD or you're working as a carer or whether you're at home shielding, um, you know, and there's so many people that have felt so much stress and pressure for, for different reasons or isolation, and it's impacted everyone, you know, and if you look at um, even, you know, the roadmap at the moment, people going back, you know, coming out of this pandemic, some people are really wanting to rush back to busy shops and get going again, others uh, are much more cautious, and I think it's, I think this pandemic has really, really taught us to listen to the way we feel. Um, do things in the way that we're comfortable uh, uh, to do, and especially going back to you know normality. You know, take things at your own uh, time and look after yourself. I really, really, really hope that a lot of things we've learned from this pandemic about self care, about investing in yourself and your own time, your own energy, will take that forward after the pandemic. Because a lot of us have been burning the candle uh, at both ends for far too long. For the early risers. As we examine the story beyond the headline. For the knowledge seekers. Welcome to Divided States. For the straight talkers, the curious, and the ones who want to be entertained. Backstage, Sky News' entertainment podcast. For wherever you are. Welcome to the Sophie Ridge on Sunday podcast. For the ones who want to know more. Welcome to the All Out Politics podcast. For the listeners. From Sky News Storycast. Sky News Podcasts. Listen and subscribe for free. My name's Ella. I'm an environmental activist and founder of the End Period Plastic Campaign. You might be thinking, why period products? What's so bad about them? They're the fifth most common item found polluting Europe's beaches. They're more commonly found than straws or coffee cups.
Welcome back to the press preview, Sophia and Gito continuing to take you through the papers. Uh, Gito, let's, let, let's come to you uh, first uh, this quarter. The, the front of the FT, uh, a positive story for, for, for some people. Australian vineyards thinking that this FTA might actually, uh, might actually do quite well for them. Yes, and it's lovely to see a picture like that and it does make you feel sort of thirsty, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> yes. And it, yes, does it does help focus uh, the mind as well because um, there are huge benefits potentially to a trade deal that liberates trade. Uh, and, and this is a very stark one. Would you like to drink very decent Australian Shiraz uh, for less than it costs you at the moment? The answer for most people is yes. But this is all part of a really, really complex, elaborate trade-off, of course, that's being negotiated. And if you then say, but if we um, actually pay less for their wine, we'll pay less for their lamb as well. And if we pay less for their lamb, will we ever buy great Welsh lamb ever again? Now, I think you should be able uh, to compete with things that are being flown halfway across the world, not to mention the carbon footprint that should be off-putting for most people. But it is difficult, and there are big, big judgment calls to be made right at the heart of number 10 at the moment that, that, that actually bring out the contradictions within the Prime Minister himself, not to mention the Cabinet, between those who feel that you have to protect certain industries uh, in, in, in the UK yeah. uh, and, and those who think, well, it's tough. You know, we, we don't do what we used to do 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. We've moved on to do other things because other people in other parts of the world can do what we used to do more cheaply. So that's how trade tends to work. It's a painful process, but this is showing you one of the potential upsides. Yeah, I mean, uh, Sophia, the headline, glass half full. I mean, anyone who knows me or indeed works with me would, who will tell you that I'm very much of the opposite variety, but I do tend to enjoy pairing a nice Australian Shiraz with a slab of Scottish beef. And I'm afraid there are aspects of the domestic economy that are going to suffer as a result of this deal, aren't there? Well, yes. I mean, I think it's funny because the Australia trade deal was meant to be very easy. I think there was a sense that, you know, these are friends and like-minded partners. Uh, they're close allies. Uh, we share many of the same interests and values. But there are distinctions. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, have lived in Australia. I have family there. And uh, I can tell you even just things like uh, farming practices, environmental standards, the sort of it, significance that's placed on animal welfare, they're just quite different uh, here in the UK. And uh, so even when you're dealing with some of your closest partners, um, it, it, these sort of roadblocks come along. Now, you know, I, I will join you in uh, being rather enthusiastic at the idea <laughs> that we could buy very good Australian wine uh, uh, more cheaply. It is rather expensive over here. Um, but I think that this is one of those cases where you just have to make sure that you look at things in the round and, and put the right safeguards in place. I mean, everything now, uh, every aspect of openness, I think we're sort of having to balance a bit off with security. And that's partly a response to this idea that, you know, maybe we had gone sort of no holds barred into uh, into globalization and, and not really thought about some of the asymmetrical costs and benefits. So I think, you know, we just need to be careful that we're striking the right balance here. But uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to find uh, many people who'd be uh, upset about the idea of cheaper Australian wine.